These have been challenging times, but the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. We've gathered in different ways, in different places, yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith. In the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity. In this moment, is no different. The power of God is unstoppable. His love unending. His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed. Our calling has not been altered. And nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes.
to do that and I realized after a moment that his face is not thrilled anymore he's scared I'm either going too fast or I'm going too hard or something and, and, and I don't know where you all you guys are at but I but I know when he says dad that's enough I put him down and it feels like right now in this world with all the chaos and all the confusion, nothing's stopping. Nothing's slowing down. The world keeps going faster and faster. Division is happening. Uncertainty is there. There's an unrest. There's a tension. There's a divide. And yet, we as the body of Christ, as the bride of the one, who is coming back for us says you can rest in me I will give you rest I will give you peace that passes all understanding I will give you joy in the midst of sorrows and in the midst of trials and so that's that's our this is our time the world right now is shaken. The church of Jesus Christ is standing on the rock that it's always stood on, which is our cornerstone, Jesus. So won't you pray with me? Father in heaven, you are good and you are gracious. You are merciful. You are king. You are the one who, who gives faith. You are the one who gives joy. You are the one who gives peace. You are the one who brings confidence. And so we've drawn the line in the sand as a church, God. We said we're not going over to that portion. We're not going over to the fear portion. We are, we are staying confident. We're staying true in your word. And we are asking that you would meet us where we're at. So we love you, we praise you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.'ew. That was a, that was good. That was good. If you're taking notes, the title of today's sermon is The Word Implanted. The Word Implanted. We're going to be in James 1, 19 through uh, 27. You see, the Word calls us not just to read, not just to do, or not just to hear, but to do as well. Before we jump into it, I want to give a little bit of context to the book of James. James, half-brother to Jesus, writes this letter to the Jewish Christians 
The letter is written early to mid-40s as these Jewish believers are being persecuted due to their faith. Leading up to verse 19, the theme is joy in trials. Verse 19 shifts the theme to faith in action. Not just hearing the word, but doing the word as well. In the midst of the text, James writes, Receive the implanted word, showing that the word needs to take root deep within and thereafter produce fruit. Let us read. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and uh, and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is, was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless." Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are good, you are gracious. We come to you now and we ask that the word would be implanted in our hearts, in our minds, in the deepest parts of our bodies, in the days of trials, in the days of uncertainty, we can turn to the Word, knowing that it is good, because you are good. We love you, we praise you, we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. There's an old story about a man in New York City who died at the age of 63 without ever having had a job. He spent his entire adult life in college. He had acquired so many academic degrees that they looked like the alphabet behind his name. Why did this man spend his entire life in college? When he was a child, a wealthy relative died who had named him as a beneficiary in his will. It stated that he was to be given enough money to support him every year as long as he stayed in school. And it was to be discontinued when he had completed his education. The man met the terms of the will, but by staying in school indefinitely, he turned a technicality into a steady income for life, something his benefactor never intended. Unfortunately, he spent thousands of hours listening to professors and reading books, but never doing He acquired more and more knowledge, but didn't put it in to practice. In the midst of James, we find something amazing. There are trials going on during the time that James writes this. You see, these these Jewish Christians were not that strong in their faith, just to be honest. To the point where if we went a little bit further, I believe in um, chapter 2, it talks about the sin of partiality. The reason why he's saying this is because these believers were still in the midst of people who haven't turned to Christ. They were still in the midst of Jewish men that were affluent. And so, instead of treating everyone equally, like James points out, by saying you should go and you should take care of the orphans and the widows, they would change depending on who they were around. So you have this, but you also have that some of these Jewish people were actually physically persecuting them. And so there was a time of unrest 
there was a time where these believers were weary. But I think it's so important what James gives for application. So tonight, we're going to be looking at three important aspects of the word. Three important aspects of the word. And I'm going to do something differently. I'm going to give you all... I'm going to give them all at once, and we're going to go through them individually. So point number one, if you are taking notes, the revelation of the word. That is found in verse 19. The word of God needs to be heard. Point number two, the reception of the word. The word of God needs to be received. And then point number three, the repercussion of the word, which is 22 through 27. So let's dive right in. The word of God needs to be heard, the revelation of the word. Verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You see, James starts out by saying, be quick to hear, be quick to listen. But the rest, you need to be slow. You need to be slow. Calm down. Take it easy. Try to understand. Slow to anger. Slow to speech. The word of God needs to be heard. I'm excited about uh, the time that we have tonight, but I'm excited last, last week was a pivotal time, I guess you could say. It's an anniversary. It falls right on Halloween. It's called Reformation Day. And what that is, so now we're one week past or so, so it would have been uh, 503 years and one week from today was the day that Martin Luther took his 95 theses, a nail, and a hammer. And he went to the church door of Wittenberg. And that's where he nailed in with his hammer, this 95 theses. Why would he do that? Well, Martin Luther, who was the catalyst of the 16th century Protestant Reformation... He grew up taking Latin classes. By the age of 13 years old, he was going to school for his bachelor's and master's degree in law. While walking home one day, a bolt of lightning struck the ground by him. He yells out out of desperation, Save me, St. Anne, and I will become a monk. Strange request, but um, he was good to his promise. While he was in the monastery and while he's doing these things that he thought were, was a devotion to God, he struggled with the doctrine of justification. It was him reading the word that he came to an understanding of faith in Christ and became born again. The word of God was revealed to him. We can go to Romans 10, 14, where it says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Keeping on the theme with Martin Luther, Martin Luther uh, is quoted by saying, A simple layman, a simple layman, armed with scripture, is to be believed above a pope or a council without it. A simple layman with scripture. I love that. I absolutely love that. I think it's funny, too, because during this time where Martin Luther was trying to understand how uh, righteousness worked, He's looking at this and he's saying to himself, where there's a holy and righteous God, good, never sinned, he cannot be in the presence of sin, and we are broken, imperfect people who have no righteousness. The Reformation text is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, where it says, 
For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so, something amazing happened during this time of Martin Luther struggling, reading, reading the Old Testament, reading the New Testament, going to the Psalms, trying to figure out how this happens. He realizes that it's not faith plus merit. It's not faith plus deed. It is not faith plus indulgence. It's faith alone. The Word of God was revealed to someone like Martin Luther. Point number two, the Word of God needs to be received. The reception of the Word, this starts in verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Not just hearing it or reading it and leaving it, but having it planted inside of you to the deepest parts so that you can remember it in the darkest hour. I think about... um, my, my job um, as a chaplain, I have the privilege of going into facilities that um, right now are closed down. I get the COVID test every 10 days, um, and I have a car full of masks, goggles, gloves, and gowns. And so I, I go to these places, and I have to gown up, glove up, goggle up, mask up, and I walk in, and I spend time with uh, the patient, hour, two hours, whatever it may be, and then I come out. And before walking out the door of the facility, I'm so careful about taking off. What do I take off first? So I take off the gown, and I ball it up, and I put it in there, and then I grab some hand sanitizer, and I try to wipe around, and then I take off other things. And the last thing that I take off are my gloves. And when I take off my gloves... I try to make sure that my hand, my skin, doesn't touch the outside of the glove. I kind of fold them up and I put them in the trash can, hand sanitizer, walk out. Why do I do that? I do that because I don't want to bring something home. Or first and foremost, I don't want something to get inside of me that shouldn't be there. That is, produces sickness. It's awful. But then I don't want to bring something home to my family that would be destructive to them. And so when James writes this in 21, he says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. This is an illustration of literally taking something off to put on something great. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Psalm 119.11 I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of God. Truth. And so my question during a time of trial with everything that's going on right now in the world, the world doesn't seem normal right now. Where do we find our normalcy? Are you going to the word of God? Are you getting this day by day? Are you reading it, but not just reading it, but implanting it within yourself? I have a fear My fear is this, that so many of us bring our Bibles to church, we open them up, we leave, and we'll leave them in the car for the next week. We'll put them up on a bookshelf for the next week. We'll allow a little bit of dust to get to them. My question to you today is, did you go today without eating food? Did you go today without drinking water? 
If you didn't do those two things, then you shouldn't have gone today without opening up the Word of God and letting it get to the most inner parts of you so that it can radically change you so that you can be confident in taking off the filth. So you can be confident in taking off the wickedness. And you can receive it with meekness. Meekness in this term is a gentleness. It's a humility. It's going against the lifestyle that uh, the Jews during this time are living by. Again, when, when prominent people are coming to them, they change the way they act. They change their demeanor. Instead of focusing on the widows and orphans, they're so concerned by who they're around, kind of that social status, kind of that power trip. And so James is writing this to say, take all that and put it aside and receive with meekness, gentleness, and humility the word that can save your soul. So we see the attitude of man, and we see the magnitude of the word, that it is able to save your soul. We already know that the word of truth, not just scripture in general, but what the word of truth is referencing here is the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It has power to save. And not just that, because there are commentaries that will we'll read and will say, well, James is writing this to believers. So he's not just talking about the salvation, but he's talking about the sanctification. Sanctification is the process there which after salvation... It's that you are continuously being saved until the day of completion by the word of truth, by the gospel. And so point number two, the reception of the word. The word of God needs to be received. So my question to you, are you hearing the word of God? Are you receiving the word of God? Are you putting everything aside and saying, I want this to live inside me so that it changes me so I look differently than everyone else? So that I can say that I'm a child of God, that I'm following in the path, that I'm getting in his word and I'm studying it and I'm trying to, um, I am trying to live a devoted life to Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, lastly, the repercussion of the word, 22 through 27. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Now, as a, uh, someone who gets up and preaches, um, I, I like to try to bridge the gap and I do that by something called illustrations, right? Well, I don't even need to put an illustration here because James already puts the illustration here. He is saying, you're going to the mirror, you're looking at yourself, and the minute you walk away, you're forgetting who you are. And my question, who are you in Christ? Again, these Jews were, were, were living one way, and then they were kind of shaken, and there uh, were trials, and uh, there's persecution, and they don't know which way to go. There is uncertainty, and so in the beginning, he's talking about find joy in your trials, and now he's saying it's time to put faith into action, faith into motion. It's time to remember who you are and who saved you. Who you are and who saved you. When I think about repercussion, uh, a lot of times I think about the negative, right? 
growing up, there's been times where there was uh, a repercussion for, for something that I have done, right? So an example of this would be if I were to speed and there was a cop there, I would get a speeding ticket. You can go back in my childhood and you can find a lot of repercussions. A lot of times that I was grounded, a lot of times that I had stuff taken away from me, that was a repercussion, but repercussions can also be good. It doesn't just need to be a negative thing. I think about what is the, ref what is the repercussion of the Protestant Reformation as we celebrated it 503 years. Well, a return to Scripture. Where they look at Scripture alone. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Those are all repercussions from something that happened. And that was a time where uh, I believe William Tyndale was burned at the stake during this time. It was a time where Martin Luther was excommunicated. He went into hiding. It wasn't a pretty time. It, wasn't a cert it, was, a, it was an uncertain time. And so, so many times for me in my life, and especially when there is um, outward chaos, where there is COVID, where there is a presidential election that's going on for the fifth day, that's a joke, by the way, um, where there's all of this stuff going on in life, we don't know whether we're coming, we don't know whether we're going, we don't know what's going on, there's uncertainty in our times and where are we going to turn? Verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. During a time of trials, during a time of persecution, the Jewish Christians could be blessed. And so I say that today to you, that we can be blessed. We are blessed, but we can be blessed. We can be blessed by not focusing on the things of this world, but focusing on the law of liberty. Colin, what's the law of liberty? The law that is ultimately fulfilled in Christ Jesus. That's the law of liberty. Right now, I don't think a word that comes to mind, we've been hearing about freedom all, all this week, right? Freedom, freedom, freedom. I'm getting my freedom taken away. I want, I'm voting for this candidate because of freedom, all of this stuff. We can't really truly be free either way with a president, but we can be free in Christ Jesus. We can be free. He has paid our ransom. He has left the riches of heaven. He has come to the muck and the mire. He has lived a sinless life and he died a cruel, cruel cross, or he died a cruel, cruel death on the cross for you and for me so that we can say we are free, free indeed. The gospel breaks the chains, breaks the yoke, breaks the bondage, and it says, I love you. You have worth. You are mine. November 14, 2010 was when I was saved, and so um, in uh, uh, a week, I'm going to celebrate a decade found in Jesus Christ, and I'm excited by that. I'm thrilled by that. It has been a roller coaster, but I can tell you because I can give you some, some things about Colin Terenzini that I don't want anyone knowing about Colin Terenzini. I can tell you that I am an insecure person at times. I can tell you I care about what my image looks like. I can tell you those things. I can tell you those things have kept me up at night. I can tell you those things have really bothered me over the years. And I love every time I think about the word freedom and how I was a slave to sin, how I was locked in captivity, and yet he came to this world and he died on a cross so that I don't have to pay that price. So I could have freedom found in Jesus. So I can have a home and a mansion in heaven. So I can have an eternity of worship saying, Worthy, worthy, worthy are you 
to break the seal on the scroll found in Re Revelation chapter 5. That's what excites me. That I don't have to worry about my own doing, my own deeds, my own merits, nothing like that. I worry about the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ, how he paid it for me, and he says, follow after me. Let, leave everything beside. Turn away from the wickedness. Turn away from the filthiness. And with meekness, receive me. I love that. The repercussion of the word. What is it doing in your life right now? And so there is this image where we hear the word of God, where we receive the word of God, where we let it implant in us, and then from that, all of a sudden, fruits. That the Christian life will produce fruit. The word of God in your life, if you are receptive to it, and it is in the most uh, deepest places of your life, there will be an outward expression. What does that look like? What does that look like? What is the repercussion in your and my ordinary lives? I want to tell you this story. A Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball won a shoe store clerk to Jesus. His name was D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody went to England and awakened the heart of a young pastor named F.B. Meyer. F.B. Meyer became one of the great Bible expositors he came to the U.S. and preached on the college campus, on college campuses, and was used to convert a student to Christ named Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman attended one of Moody's meetings in Chicago and became D.L. Moody's co-worker. Wilbur Chapman employed an ex-baseball player as his assistant by the name of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday became a great evangelist and preached in Charlotte, North Carolina at a meeting organized by Billy Sun Sunday Layman's Evangelistic Club, renamed CBMC for Christian Businessmen's Committee. CBMC invited an evangelist named Mordecai Ham to preach. He preached that night in a tent meeting where a young man by the name, you won't know this name, Billy Graham was in attendance. Think about that. Think about the ordinary life. I want to go back to the top. A Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball won a shoe store clerk to Jesus. Just saying that gives me chills because imagine that Sunday school teacher who may have thought, am I doing anything for the sake of Christ? Is this pointless? My Sunday school isn't growing. I don't, I don't know if I'm being effective. I don't know what to teach on. I'm overwhelmed. I'm burnt out. I need a break. What is the repercussion of the word of God? I don't think we'll know the repercussion in fullness, the word of God, in our lives until, until glory, actually. But here is the theme of all this. James preaches to a group of Jewish Christians who are struggling. They're struggling with persecution. They're struggling with... Um, who they should hang out, where they should go, what they should do. They're struggling with um, th these people who they would put value on importance coming in, and all of a sudden, the way that they talk, the way they speak, the way they think, the way they act changes, and James picked up on that. And he writes this letter, and he says, "Don't the ones that you need to be concerned about are the lowly. 
The ones that you need to be concerned about are the orphans. The one that you need to be concerned about are the widows. Put everything aside. Strip yourself of the wickedness. Strip yourself of everything. And with meekness and humility, put the Word of God in your life. And so we see that we need to hear the Word of God. We need to receive the Word of God. And then we need to live by the Word of God and watch it just do something that you and I couldn't do by ourselves. But with that being said, I don't know if you're here for the very first time, and I want to give an opportunity uh, because uh, before you can um, go out and say, I want, to, uh, I, I want to see how my life matters, before you can go out and, and do that, before we can talk about you know, the sanctification or, or those types of words, we need to understand that there is a good and gracious God that died on a cross for you and for me. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and he rose on the third day. And that is the gospel. The gospel is the good news. It's the fact that you and I are broken. You and I are rebels. You and I are sinful. The best thing that you and I can do is muster up some sin to give to God. And God knew that. And he knows that now. And so 2,000 years ago, he sends his son to die on a cross because his son was perfect. And his son was the sacrifice for our atonement, for the atoning of our sins. And so we can put our faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I've talked to you about um, 10 years ago coming up on a decade of me being in Christ. It's the greatest decision I've ever made. It is the greatest decision I have ever made. And I beg of you, if you are here for the very first time, maybe you're here because you uh, were at the community outreach and you thought to yourself, I want to I wanna go check out this church. I want to get plugged in. I would beg of you not just to get plugged in of this church. We're so thankful you're here, but that you would get plugged into Jesus. And the way you do that is by admitting you are a sinner, believing Christ and the gospel, and putting your faith in him. If that's you tonight and you want to take that next step, I would love to talk to you. Pastor Seth would love to talk to you. Make it known to one of us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for the worship. We thank you that we can come and we can hear about the word of God. We can see that uh, in James, talking to the Jewish community, that he says, don't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Put that faith into action and go and take care of the lowly. Go and take care of the widows. Go and take care of the orphans. Go to the where people wouldn't normally go. Give yourself up. And so, Father, I ask that that would be for me. I ask that this would be for everyone in this room. That we would say we want to make a difference for Christ because we've heard the word, we've received the word, and we're living by the word. And so meet us here. Allow us to make these commitments. Implant in us an eagerness and a zealousness to read your word and to live by your word and to do your word and to just live out the gospel in our lives. We praise you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Go be the church.